Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of PyCon AU. Um, our next speaker is Matt Trentini, who will be speaking to us about the wonders of extending MicroPython. Please make him feel welcome. Thanks, folks. Nothing like getting stuff done right at the last minute, is there? OK. Extending my, so you'll see on a bunch of my slides today, um, there's a whole raft of QR codes just sitting in the bottom right corner as we go through. You'll be able to scan them on your phones if you really want to, but they're there for reference for later. Um, this first one will take you to the, the slides themselves. So that's good. Hopefully levels are OK back there. Yeah, cool. So who am I? I am the guy who's not making those slides turn over. There we go. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've had about uh, 20 years' experience, which makes me feel a bit old, as I said in my bio. Um, I've been fortunate enough to sort of play with the entire software stack, so all the way down from uh, very small devices all the way up to large websites and desktop applications in between, the whole shebang. Uh, but a common theme of mine, I suppose, is to work with embedded devices as part of a larger system. So um, I got into MicroPython a few years ago just because uh, I think it's wonderful. And so I just wanted to acknowledge pretty much the front row here, if you could just put your hands up. Uh, Damien, Oliver, Sean, Andrew, and Jim have all really helped with this, this talk. Uh, it's quite a detailed talk. And some of these features of MicroPython weren't even working before yesterday. So um, we've pulled it together through a few really hero heroic efforts. So thanks, guys. If it works out great, it's because of them. Um, if it's not so good today, then it's almost certainly my fault. So. Um, why this talk? I, I think it's necessary. Um, there's some good reasons up here on, on, the, on the screen. I think, um, but <laughs> sort of speaking from the heart, I guess, uh, is that C has been entrenched in the embedded space for, for decades, since the 70s, right? And nothing has really changed. If you look at the way we're doing development today, uh, you, you, you know, not much has changed at all. Like the, the tools have gotten marginally better. The compilers have gotten marginally better. Um, but you know, if you look at other parts of the software systems, um, we've gone up through high-level languages. We've got better tooling for unit testing. Uh, we've got much better IDE support in other languages. Um, and it really improves the developer experience. So for me, I see MicroPython or high-level language like it running on an embedded device as a way of disrupting that and breaking that cycle and allowing us to move faster in that embedded space. Um, so my vision is that MicroPython can be the go-to, or a go-to at least, um, of being able to develop on that embedded space. Um, now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, as I said, all the Python goodness that we all know and love allows us to develop faster. Um, but specific to the embedded space, being able to develop interactively with a REPL is a complete game changer as far as I'm concerned. Um, and if you've got sort of these stubborn C guys in your office that uh, uh, sort of latch onto it and don't really want to um, change or evolve or look at new things, go show them the REPL, show them that they can change stuff at runtime, um, show them that they can do an I2C scan. And if they're not converted, you're going to struggle to convert them. Um, I've tried. <laughs> um, anyway, I think, it's, I think it's an important thing. I really want to um, sort of push the MicroPython angle. Um, but there are genuine performance concerns. So it's an interpreted language. It's not as fast as a compiled language like C. And we need to tackle that. There's some, some good options that we have. And the guts of today's talk uh, will we'll cover one of those options. OK, so specifically, the main dish, um, the I fill it, if you will, um, is that we're going to create a module in pure Python. And a spoiler alert, it's going to run pretty slow. Uh, we're, going to, again, we're going to then re-implement that in C, and it's going to run a lot faster. And I'm going to show you how you can wrap that um, so that you can access that from the MicroPython space. Now, that's, um, that gives us the best of both worlds, because we can do most of our development in MicroPython. And when performance dictates, we can drop back, drop back down into C and uh, handcraft some stuff to make it work a lot faster. Um, it's a really powerful concept, I think. The only problem with this concept, I suppose, is that it does require you to build the MicroPython blob. So your C module that you create um, gets built in alongside the whole of the MicroPython firmware, which you then deploy to your device. So it's an important distinction. 
Um, like any good meal, we've got a couple of entrees today. Um, we're going to start with some background. Um, I just want to get everyone up to the, sort of the same level about talking about what MicroPython is and some of the fundamental concepts around what a port is. You'll hear us talking about ports, and you need to understand what that, that means and how they're built. Um, so we'll cover that. We'll also have a look, really quick look at micro-optimizations, as we like to call. This is, these are things you can do to, um, thank you. These are things you can do to uh, improve performance um, without having to get down and dirty with, with C. So they're a little bit easy to apply in, in the majority of the cases. And you can get some genuine performance improvements from them. Uh, right. uh, as a dessert, we've got native modules. Now, this is the feature I referred to as uh, it's being definitely bleeding edge. But I mentioned before that regular MicroPython C module requires you to build a whole firmware binary. Uh, a native module lets you not do that. So you can download and use your regular um, MicroPython blob, and then you can build your own module and just load that at runtime. Um, it's a natural evolution of, uh, of going down this route, but it's, um, it's a really wonderful way of uh, developing. We'll also talk about some ramifications about how, what that feature can uh, unlock. Uh, so let's get into it. What is MicroPython? Um, Actually, can I have a show of hands who's used MicroPython? So 70%, that's good. Um, keep your hand up if you've used C in the embedded space. Probably the same people, a, a similar number anyway. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, so MicroPython is written in C. It's an implementation of Python designed to run on microcontrollers. So the main difference there is, I guess, it's really concerned with um, minimizing resource usage, in particular RAM. Now, um, memory use is probably our first constraint when we hit these uh, micro microcontrollers. But it's not just a language. Um, like Python, we inherit the idea of batteries included. So we have a bunch of libraries, a bunch of the standard libraries uh, that are implemented. Um, we also have hardware library. Uh, we call it machine. And if I've got, I won't play with it yet, but uh, if we've got a microcontroller much like this one, it has a bunch of uh, hardware peripherals that we want access to. Uh, Machine's one of the libraries that we supply that um, uh, provides those, those features. Um, you also get a file system, and as I said before, you get a REPL as well. And so all this gives you a pretty wonderful starting point for development. Uh, okay, so the structure of a MicroPython system. Uh, I heard in the other talks the hand-drawn uh, pictures are the way to go, especially with stick figures, apparently, with smiley faces. So you're, you're allowed to... Um, uh, Attach yourselves to that somehow. Anyway, um, so over here we have a compiler. That's annoying. <laughs> we have a compiler, um, and then much like uh, C Python, you have a compiler which turns your Python files into bytecode. Okay, and then that's what the, that's what the virtual machine can run. Uh, you have a runtime which is responsible for doing stuff. Uh, we kind of gloss over some of those details. But it has access to the um, to modules that are packaged as part of MicroPython. Now, those modules can be in Python or they can be in C. It doesn't matter to the runtime. So you'll see that in the bottom little blob here, we've got a whole bunch of things that I wrote down, which my handwriting is almost illegible, so I'm surprised if you can read them anyway. Um, and then we've got some off to the side. Now, the distinction there is what we're going to talk about in a second, which is a port. So a port is a variant of MicroPython or a... Uh, a, a, a blob of MicroPython, which includes the compiler, the virtual machine, the runtime, which is all cross-platform. Uh, it's also a collection of libraries, and that can change depending on the, on the port that we're talking about, depending on the hardware we're targeting. Uh, and we've also got the machine stuff. So if we jump back to here, these libraries on the right are machine-specific. They are definitely, they have different implementations depending on which microcontrollers you're using, right? So if you're using uh, a SAMD chip, if you're using an ESP32 or using an STM32, these manufacturers all provide you with ways of accessing their hardware at a low level. Um, but, of course, that's different from port to port. So at this point, each of the ports of MicroPython are actually built slightly differently because they've got different dependencies. It also means that all the stuff to the left of this box, these boxes on, on the right, all of that gets, gets reused for the most part. It's all cross-platform code. Uh, and all the stuff to the right needs to be redone for each of the ports, right? Because we need to figure out how we make our connection to the I squared C features of that hardware or the, the pins that are part of that hardware. So fundamentally, that's kind of the, the, the gist of a port. Um, it's 
probably worth saying that MicroPython works on a lot of different bits of hardware. So this is a photo I took the other night um, where I just bought a whole bunch of devices that I have. Um, I had a quick count. There's like 80 different microcontrollers on that page. And there's about five different families across you know, 20 or 30 different boards. It's quite a lot of large number of things. And so each of these things has a, a different port. Um, I just want to get back to something here. At the bottom here, there's a line that talks about board support. Because if you're familiar with the embedded space, you'll be aware that there's usually a family of microcontrollers. But when, it, when the uh, pedal hits the metal, uh, the boards are important. So the, the way that that, um, that microcontroller is constructed in a board, there's certain pins that can be broken out. And they can differ even within families of, of micro, um, microcontrollers. So the concept is that um, you have a port which describes like a, a family. Uh, and you would have a board which describes a, a physical board um, of a microcontroller. And so today, today we'll be playing with a couple of devices here. One of them will be ESP32 based, uh, which is this one on the left. It's a tiny Pico. And the one on the right is a Pi Board D, which is an STM32 based. Now, if those names don't mean anything, that's perfectly fine. You can come talk to me afterwards and give you more detail. It is worth covering uh, which ports are available in MicroPython. So on the left, we've got all the official ports. Uh, the QR code will take you to the MicroPython page, which has the list of uh, or the folders of all those different families. Uh, and on the right is uh, unofficial ports, but are still gaining in popularity, I suppose. And there's a whole bunch of other weird and wonderful ports out there for various custom bits of hardware. Um, the top group, uh, sorry. the top group up here is sort of officially supported and ready for prime time, I guess you could say. Um, they're widely used um, and very active in, in development. Uh, the bottom few are somewhat interesting. The SAMD is an interesting one because it's quite new. We've got very little hardware support for it at the moment. But it's notable because a lot of the Adafruit boards use that, um, that microcontroller family. Um, so it'll be great to unlock more of those features. And that's something that's in active development right now. The CC3200 and the Teensy boards I've just listed because um, we do have support for them. It's, it's there, but it's less active, I suppose. They're not being uh, as actively to, um, used. Uh, Zephyr is another one that's interesting because Zephyr is a, uh, a real-time operating system, and it abstracts away a lot of the hardware. So there's an extra layer sitting between MicroPython and the hardware itself. But that means if we can target the way Zephyr operates, we can use any of the boards that Zephyr supports. So there's 150 boards that Zephyr uses, or that Zephyr can work on. MicroPython can now access any of those by sitting on top of Zephyr. So it's quite an interesting area of development. And finally, there's a JavaScript version as well. So we use Inscription to uh, get down to WASM, um, and the rabbit hole continues down. Yeah. It's worth mentioning, uh, I think, a really interesting area for those that are in the hardware space is around Risk v um, both in the soft core space and in the hardware. Um, so uh, we've got really good support in MicroPython for that now. Uh, Propeller 2 I've got listed up there because it's a weird and wonderful, amazing bit of hardware. Uh, and they have the first iteration of the Propeller 1 board. Uh, you can go look this up later. It's got some really unique hardware characteristics. Very good at um, multiprocessing um, uh, execution. Um, but they had quite an esoteric sort of language that they developed themselves for the first generation of the hardware. For the second generation of the hardware, they've picked up MicroPython and run with it. And it seems to be unlocking a lot of features really quickly for them. So I think it's a really exciting area of development. Okay, now I've lost my spot again. Right, straight into the micro optimizations. We've got um, avoiding globals, which is generally uh, a good thing to do anyway. Um, in MicroPython, it's quite important. Uh, we'll see here on the left is what you shouldn't do, because if you look at what's happening, is that um, pin on and pin off are actually in the global namespace, so the lookups for those are a little bit slow. So just simply keeping a label um, to those methods. Um, if you're inside a tight loop, that can give you some performance benefit. Um, we did some measurements, and it's like 10 to 20% faster in some cases. Now, that's a fairly contrived example, but if you're looking at um, getting some performance, it's a really easy one to do. Uh, Cons, I've got this as red because I hadn't quite finished the example, but I can walk you through it. Uh, it's just a simple extension. Um, so that when you store a variable, you can store it with the label of const. 
And that means that MicroPython won't do it as a lookup. It'll just replace the number wherever it's used in the code. So it saves you a dereference. Uh, optimization is pretty complex. So I mentioned before, if we can get back to that diagram, it's way back. Just like uh, C Python, we have a compiler, and we compile it down to virtual to, to bytecode so the virtual machine can uh, ingest it. You can skip that step by doing pre-compilation. Um, that means that you can uh, create that bytecode and store it as an MPy file, just like um, the PyC files in the, in the Python world. Um, that means that you use a little bit less RAM because you save, you avoid the compilation step, which takes some RAM. And it's also a bit faster to get going because we don't have that compilation step uh, at the point where uh, import occurs. Probably worth mentioning too, normally the um, conversion to bytecode is transparent like in C Python, but it's, it's a little bit different in that we don't, don't normally store the bytecode on the device. Normally it occurs in memory as soon as you do an import. Okay, so you import your code, you get your bytecode that's stored in RAM, and then from then on it's executed from there. But we do have the concept of an MPy file, so you can do that manually and skip this step. It does slightly complicate deployment because normally you would just get your Py files onto the device. Now you've got to have some sort of make file to create your MPy files. Okay. Frozen modules. So frozen modules takes that a little bit further and takes your bytecode that you've created from your pre-compilation step and stores it in the MicroPython uh, binary blob. So this requires you to build MicroPython, but it also allows you to store the, the pre-compiled bytecode in, in amongst that uh, uh, binary blob. Now, this is useful because it saves further memory because we can execute from Flash. So uh, we store this in the binary blob and we just execute the stuff uh, as we need it. Right. Um, sorry, Damien, I hope that's an okay picture. Uh, native Viper and Assembly are a bit more advanced um, things, and Damien covered these really well last year, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but uh, native and Viper in particular changed the way that uh, code is emitted from the compiler um, to the virtual machine. So instead of creating bytecode, we actually create native code. Now there's some complications with this, I guess, in the sense that it can use more memory, but you can get some real performance benefits. Um, so I think it's, it's quite interesting. Um, the assembly option is a bit different. It lets you create uh, Python functions in amongst your Python, which translate directly into assembly for the, for the um, platform you're targeting. Um, so if you're handcrafting a really small sort of tight loop, assembly can be a really good option. And uh, I'll direct you to Damien's talk because he'll show you how to make it like 400 times faster in assembler. So uh, that was really cool. Right, so we're at the main meal. How far are we in? 25 minutes. Right. We're going to be talking about QR codes. This is, it's probably no surprise, right? We've got QR codes all over these slides. Um, Generating a QR code on a device like this is actually fairly computationally difficult. Um, it's all built around this concept of the Reed Solomon algorithm, which if you've used a CD or a DVD or a Blu-ray device, uh, you'll be familiar with, even if not uh, explicitly. Uh, it allows you to encode data with redundancy. So the reason these pictures can work in QR codes is because there's redundant data in there, uh, and the picture's you know, throwing away some of that data because you're just drawing over the top of it. But the Reed Solomon algorithm allows you to, to um, get that data back anyway. It's a wonderful algorithm, um, but also a little bit slow to use on, a, on an embedded device. Um, so yeah, QR codes are being uh, QR codes are the, the, the task that I'm going to use today to, to look at this stuff. But it could have been anything. It could have been Fourier transforms, which are computationally expensive. Um, could have been you know, a camera module. Could be anything that takes a lot of time. Um, uh, it's also, it also did help that there's an issue raised in the MicroPython ticketing system that says we don't have a QR library, so now we've got one. So, excuse me while I have a drink. These deep dives are long, by the way. Um, first thing I did, like any good Python developer, is to go onto the web and find out what was out there, and there's a whole bunch of QR libraries. Project Naoki was really interesting to me because it, it implemented uh, QR generation in seven different languages. Um, it's got really clear documentation. There's lots of code comments. Uh, it's all about uh, being really clear, uh, sort of 
hold it up as a good example of how to do um, QR codes in any of those languages. Um, they're all about a thousand lines of code, and uh, yeah, it's it's excellent. Um, now, I should say that MicroPython is built around Python 3.5, more or less. And there are some differences between MicroPython and CPython. So the Py when, if you're going to go through this effort of, of taking a library that's designed for Python and making it run on MicroPython, there's always some work to be done. And so I thought we'd uh, go on a little distraction looking at those kinds of things that, um, that I went through for this particular, particular task. Um, so my goal here was to use identical code on CPython and MicroPython. Um, I wanted to run on uh, Python 3x. Um, so the first thing I ran into was that there was a reference to future because they supported Python 2x. Now, our Wi-Fi password here is um, Python means Python 3, so I just got rid of that. <laughs> so we've, we've gotten rid of Python 2x um, backwards compatibility at this stage. It would actually be really easy to add that. It's just a, we just need a stub for the future to ignore that in MicroPython, but anyway, it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, the regular expression library in MicroPython is designed to use a lot less memory or low amounts of memory, uh, and it was missing a really odd little uh, quirk that um, they decided to use in Project Naoki, which was a slash Z argument. Um, has anyone used the slash Z argument in regular expressions? I hadn't either. It was, um, it's designed to match at the end of the line uh, for multi-line um, uh, matches. Uh, there wasn't any, even any multi-line matches in this project, so I couldn't figure out why they used that. So got rid of that. That was easy. Sys version info, uh, it's slightly different in MicroPython. I've raised a ticket about this. I'm not sure we'll make any changes, but in MicroPython, it's a tuple, uh, whereas in regular CPython, it's a class, and the class provides access to major, minor, and um, patch versions by label. So with the tuple, uh, and so, uh, CPython actually supports both. You can do index, so zero matches major, one matches minor. Um, but yeah, MicroPython only supports the, the indexed access. Um, so I changed it to index access and that was fine, but we're considering adding um, the label support as well. Uh, and libraries. Libraries are usually where you'll spend most of your time porting your MicroPython code, um, which is worth mentioning that there's MicroPython lib. I'm, Often surprised that people aren't aware that there's a separate repo with, with libraries, and we do a terrible job of communicating it, so hence here, right? Um, so this is community maintained, although it's curated so that it always works with MicroPython mainline, uh, and it's upip installable, which we should cover as well. Uh, just quickly, that's the, what, the GitHub for the MicroPython lib. That page goes on for a while because there's yeah, over 130 or 140 libraries now. Um, upip is just pip for MicroPython, effectively. Um, but this is kind of a bit of a revolution when you're first doing development. Um, so on an embedded device like this one, which actually has Wi-Fi support, I can install one of the libraries, if it's got um, pip support, directly on the device. So uh, I needed iter tools. That one has been published uh, to pip, so I can just upip install MicroPython iter tools. Um, yeah, there's, there's no, no other tools needed for that, which is pretty cool. Um, and the embedded C developer in me is like, oh, that just that shouldn't be that easy. That's just not right, um, which is great. Uh, if you're using a device, uh, a smaller device or one without Wi-Fi, um, UPIP's also supported. Uh, it just downloads the files to your PC so you can transfer them across later. Um, it's not much more difficult. It's just, it's just so cool being able to go, you know, UPIP install something. It's, it's great. Anyway, getting back to MicroPython lib, um, 130, tool, 130 libraries. Uh, Iter tools went in. That just worked straight out of the box. Naiki also required uh, DEC. Uh, now, we have a DEC implementation in the core MicroPython um, binary in, in, the, in the main, main line. But it's actually been, it's, it's quite a cut down version designed so that it consumes no extra RAM. Uh, it also didn't have the functions that I needed, so that was a bit of a problem. Uh, or the functions that Naiki needed. Um, but there was an alternative implementation in MicroPython lib. I upip installed that. It got almost all the way there, but it didn't have subscripting support. Um, I'm going to add that. But in the meantime, I can just convert my deck to a list right before it gets used, and then we can use subscripting there. So I've actually introduced a performance um, penalty to this, but uh, for the purposes of this presentation, it doesn't matter. I will fix that. It's OK. I will. 
Um, so all that being said, this is an example, and it's, it's fairly typical I've found uh, importing uh, true Python code down to MicroPython and still supporting both environments. Uh, there was 12 lines that I had to convert. And so I think that's pretty amazing, to be honest, like to be able to take from the vast amount of Python libraries that are out there, with a little bit of work, we can then um, get access to them if, if they don't work straight out of the box. So it's a 900 line um, library, 12 lines that needed changing. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, right, QR codes in Python. Let's see if this works. Pretty close. That is really big. Um, I'm just summarizing this because I don't have a ton of space. Um, the Project Nayuki um, uh, Python class kind of boils down to these three functions. Uh, it's got a bunch of others as well, uh, depending on what you want to do with your QR code. But these are the only three that I needed for now. Uh, and that's to encode a text. And it takes, actually, it takes a string. I'll try to summarize it so it's nice and easy to see. Um, depending on the length of that text, uh, it kind of dictates how big it needs to make the QR code to store enough of that data. So once you've encoded it, uh, it, uh, it that's a static function. So you actually, it actually returns an instance of the QR code class. That QR code class can then be queried for the size of the QR code. And then you can get the module. And the module is, um, you. It's confusing, I know, because we're a Python community. Um, but module is actually what they call the pixel in a, um, in a QR code. So by iterating through the, the QR code, you can build up that picture of that, um, of that uh, QR code. All right. Oh, look at that. That is actually, I don't even need to do anything, because that's the QR code that comes out of it. So that's nice. And I've just printed this at the command line with um, a Unicode character which prints a white space um, and space for the other one. Uh, and I don't know if it's, you know, let's see if we can, if we can squeeze it down. So if you've got your phones, that should scan Hello World. Does anyone want to test that? Please tell me it works. I think it was Hello World. Yep, yep, confirmation. Does it work from the back? I tried it in the other room and I had to zoom in, zoom in uh, digitally, but it did work. I'm going to go with yes, that's fine. Uh, right. So that was great. Um, the problem is this. That QR code takes about 1,500 milliseconds to run, to, to generate. Um, and that's a really short QR code. I found that if you made them long, so if you've got a URL that's 30 characters, that takes like 10, 15, sometimes 20 seconds to generate, um, which is a long time for a microcontroller to be busy, especially if you've got things like watchdogs, right? So that's a problem. Um, so what about C? C, Project Naoki has a C implementation, um, which is great. Um, it is worth noting, I'm being a little bit unfair here, because the C variant has been optimized to use less memory. Um, but when I ran it, I won't go through the process of building C here, but uh, when I ran it, um, that was the amount of time it took to run almost any QR code, um, regardless of the length. So uh, that's a big difference. As I said, I'm being really unfair to MicroPython here. Uh, I'm stacking the odds heavily against it because this is a computational problem, um, which C is very good at solving, and uh, MicroPython is it's really hard for it to solve well. Uh, and I'm comparing unoptimized to optimized. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, that's great. I can tell you that you know, uh, we, we, can, we can use this, right? Because what we want is we really want some of that performance, right? Um, that's pretty good. Uh, but first, some of the feedback I had was that the deep dives were kind of long. Uh, and this one's a little bit down the, down the weeds. So just take a moment, guys. Can everyone just like, stand up? I know this sounds contrived, but um, if nothing else, it means that I can stop and just have a bit of a drink. So. Isn't that better?
I especially feel it's difficult for us because we've just eaten lunch, right? And then you come into a darkened room and you're listening to like MicroPython deep dives. So, yeah, tough. We all good? All good? Yeah, good. Okay. How to wrap a C module. Okay, so uh, what we need to do here is we, we are now committing to building a C module. We're now committing to uh, building a MicroPython C module, which means we need to wrap that C module. Okay, um, so the details here are important. Um, there's a whole bunch of methods, a whole bunch of macros, um, and what we need to learn is about marshalling because we've got values that are coming in that we need to call. So on, on the MicroPython side, we want things to look just like they would uh, as if it was a Python object we were calling. Um, and what we do need to do there is marshal values across that boundary. Okay. The interesting thing here to be aware is that the, um, the structures that we're going to create in C to specify how that marshaling occurs are, are the exact same structures that the virtual machine creates when you uh, are creating your Python code in the MicroPython environment. So what we're doing is we're sort of matching all of those structures in the C world to what the virtual machine would do. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so this is this first example is the nice simple one that we is, is actually the I mentioned before that our documentation is not great for all of this stuff. Um, the only documentation we really have on it is uh, this. Let me find it. Wow, that's big. Quite tight. Let's go. Let's do that differently. Sorry. Um, Excuse the. Okay. Right. This is actually really reasonably well written, and it walks you through a basic example. Now, that example is this one. What we're going to do is we're going to take. Is that readable if I make it a little bit smaller? Oh, that's, un that's unfortunate. Okay. This whole green box we're going to talk through, and you're going to understand. That one we'll get to in a sec. Uh, what I might do. So the goal here is to take a function which takes two integers, and we're going to return the addition of those two integers, right? We're going to start baby steps, right? So I might just get back to here, because I think I've got a useful. Right, hand drawn stuff, good. Um, on the left, we've got. What represents, what, what represents a module in MicroPython it's, it effectively is a struct in the C world. That struct has a number of pointers, one of which is a table of um, function pointers which are indexed by a string. Okay. Now, you can sort of blur your eyes and you can see that if you import a module, this is how the MicroPython environment learns what it can do with that. Uh, now, what is that? Yeah, cool. Um, so, we're going to register the module. That's the thing that we had on the left, right? We're going to say that um, we're going to give this module a name, which is example. Um, we're going to link it to this, which is actually with the module definition. Okay. That module definition uh, is linked to another thing, which is linked to another thing. Um, this is the module name. This is the name of the function we want to index. This is the pointer to that function, which takes those two ints. Right? So we've built up a bunch of pointers that eventually point to this function through a, through a series of structures. Right? This function is intended to take two uh, objects, and these objects are mpobs, which is effectively a typeless. Well, it has a type built in, but in the C world, it's it's a void star um, with a whole bunch of infrastructure around it to get the things out of it that you need. So when we register this function, we tell it that it's a, a two-parameter function. Uh, and here we've got two parameters. And so the compiler will check a lot of these things if they're not right. If you haven't got the right number of arguments here, um, it'll tell you. Um, internally, so when we execute this function, we're going to get an integer in the C space out of the object that gets passed in, in both cases. And we're just going to return them as a new integer. And that's it. I say that's it, right? But there's, there's a fair bit going on here, but um, yeah, it makes sense. 
Any questions with that? Just while we're dang, is it too much to grasp in a forum like this? Hello. Uh, yeah. So, are there differences between th thanks? Are there differences between the uh, MicroPython API and the C the Py the sorry C Python API? Uh, no, is the short answer. Yeah. So. There are differences in the way they're done, but it support, MicroPython supports all the same things. So you can pass classes, you can pass tuples, dicts, the whole shebang. Um, where it gets complicated when you're doing those marshalling is uh, trying to figure out like what types you actually want to um, pull in and out. Um, yeah. So I now the other the other half of this is so we've got we've now got um, this is C code that we need to add to our build system. Right? So we've got to choose a port to build, right? because we've got dependencies for, say, STM32 or ESP32 or whatnot. Um, these macros are required um, to, to, tell, to tell the build system uh, what to do. Um, there's, a, there's a folder, uh, which by convention is modules in the root of the, um, root of the MicroPython uh, checkout, if you, if you clone the repository. Um, so you'll throw, there'll be a modules QR. It's just hard to show here because we haven't got many pixels. Uh, modules QR and then this example. Um, uh, and then we just need to enable that module and the build system will take it and run it. Actually, here's a good example. So it's, it's literally um, two files. Now, I just said before that we need to choose which port to build it in. This is actually cross-platform or cross-port code. It works on any of the ports, um, but the only difference is that you've got to, you, you can't build across all the ports because they have different dependencies, different compile tool chains, that kind of stuff. So the same code will work on all of the ports if you've not used any port-specific code. Yeah, cool. I think that's all I had to say for that. Uh, and the example is here. I could run that, but I won't. Um, okay. Right, so I mentioned that there's a whole bunch of um, uh, macros and yeah, sorry, uh, macros and uh, uh, methods that help you bridge that marshalling gap. They're quite challenging to keep that all in your head. If you're using it a lot, then it becomes quite second nature. But I'm sure, as you know, your response when you saw it, it's like, oh, that's a lot of boilerplate to to try to wade through. Um, now we've got poor documentation on this, as I said, but uh, during uh, during researching this, this talk, uh, we stumbled across two things. The first one was uh, a guide put together by a guy named Mike Teachman. Mike's put together a, a git commit which has a whole bunch of marshalling examples. It, there's, I don't know, like 900 lines of examples. If you want to pass in a single, single parameter, if you want to pass in a list, if you want to return this, if you want to return that, if you want to use keyword arguments, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really helpful guide. So I've got a link to there. Um, but also, we had this um, idea that uh, wouldn't it be cool if you had like a website to um, just describe what parameters you, you had, uh, and then the website could generate the boilerplate. So, uh, if I've, uh, let's see if I'll just pull this back a sec. Uh, Oliver, you want to put your hand up, just to embarrass you, really. Um, Oliver was kind enough to um, to put this together. If I can find it, sorry, I've lost track of which workspace I was on. It's a dead space, isn't it? Sorry. I would love to. I should have linked in that. It would have been a smart thing to do. Um, it's gone. What's your Sorry? No, just roughly, like if you, there it is. There we go. Apologies, good man. Uh, right, God, that was hard. Okay. So this is a stub generator that Oliver's put together. And so the nice thing about this is that you can specify what parameters you want, uh, what output types you want, 
in the end. It will generate all of the, the code that you need, so you don't need to remember everything we've shown you today. Um, it doesn't yet do everything. Uh, it certainly handles all of the simple cases where you've got um, floats, strings, lists and tuples. That was a neat addition I hadn't used yet. Um, and lets you specify the argument names, all that kind of stuff. There's also a checkbox here which will add extra boilerplate um, to show you how you can do uh, extra things. Um, but, can it say, right, okay. Wow, I went quick. Um, if anyone out here has is, is used JavaScript, I don't know, raise of hands again. Fantastic, because that means you can all generate pull requests for this, right? We need to extend this, right, so that we can um, take dictionaries, so we can take classes, and so on. So uh, I think it's, it's a really useful tool. So thank you all for that, that's cool. Uh, right, if we got 10 minutes left, is that 10 minutes to 20? Great, no problem, easy, okay. Um, right, so we're gonna wrap this QR library. Uh, I wanna get to the meat of this thing. Um, so we're gonna take a string and return a tuple of tuples. Now, that's a little bit different to that class example before. Um, the class example is a little bit more uh, difficult, so I thought we'd go through this one first. Uh, oh, I didn't steal my thunder, but okay. Um, okay, so it's going to be really hard to see here, I think. Sorry, folks, I'm struggling with the uh, screen. Try and get this working. Get to the right place. There's a few different examples all mixed in here. I've called it encode text too for no good reason. Um, probably because it was the second time we tried to get this working. Um, and this goes through that uh, definition of saying what arguments uh, are available. I'm intentionally glossing over this because I think we're going to be struggling for time. Um, but there's a way to specify that this function takes keyword arguments, and so some things are optional, which of course in C is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, so uh, you can see here you get arguments and you get uh, a pointer to a list of arguments, and there's a system built up so that you can specify what you expect those arguments to be, and then there's a parser to get those things out. Um, so all of that um, hooks in to say that uh, at some point here, this is the Nayuki function, which is in C, to say pass it in, I want you to uh, get, in this case, the string argument, easy enough to read, yeah. The string argument, uh, which is arg, arg text in my world. Um, it also takes in the ECC variable. ECC is the amount of error correction that you want, so that's one of the parameters uh, in the system. I've made that uh, an optional argument in this case. Um, you can also raise exceptions. There's no reason why you can't. Uh, in this case, it's a value error, but it could be anything. Um, I think that's, that's a useful thing too. Like Again, I can't really stress enough that anything you could do in MicroPython, with sufficient persistence, you can figure out how to do it in the C world. Um, so we're getting the size, which is necessary, and then we're building up a tuple. And there's a bit of magic here to create a new tuple and uh, massage that into shape in the C side. Uh, but effectively we return a series of rows and columns that are in that tuple. Okay. Let's see if we can get this working. It's not a great sign. Okay. Naturally the demo gods uh, started playing with me before because uh, it appears that the, the one of these cables that I've got is not working that great. <laughs> so let's try it again. The problem is I don't know which one it is. No, it's not going to happen. Damn it. 
Um, sorry? Um, possibly, maybe I've got one here. Just speak amongst yourself for just a moment, people. That's all right. Uh, I've got this one. It should be all right. The best laid plans and all that. Good sign. So I'm using a tool called RShell, which allows us to have a serial connection to, to a MicroPython device, this one here, ESP32-based one. It's a tiny Pico. Um, it's a neat little device. Um, we're going to import my QR library that we've just built before. Um, now, encode text. Let's create this. Right, we get a tuple of tuples of stuff. Now that uh, is running through C. That's pretty cool. Um, the nice thing about this is that my thunder that was stolen before is that that takes 11 milliseconds to run. Um, so I think that's that's really amazing. I'm, I, I can't stress to you how cool that is, right? <laughs> but, but, but yeah. <laughs> I really could have delivered that better, but it's, um, yeah. Right, so, sorry? <laughs> okay. um, the next thing I wanted to show you really quickly uh, is that you can, we talked before that you can construct any sort of object, uh, including a class, because that, the way that's returned is different to the way that the Project Naoki Python implementation worked, right? Before we had the three functions that returned a class, the class had uh, access to functions to get at the data. Um, you, you can do that with uh, MicroPython. But buckle up. <laughs> um, so this is, the, this is a, an expanded view of the one we saw before. So just, Damien, I need to get you to sign this because it'll be worth something someday, I'm sure. Um, at the top, we've got modules, right? The module links to a lookup to find the functions that are in that modules. Uh, those functions could be an instance of a class or a, a definition of a class. That class has a bunch of functions that you can associate with it. One of those uh, function pointers points to a table, which is the methods that are associated with that class. One of those methods on the class needs to create an instance of the class itself. That instance then winds back to say what its definition is. Did I get that close? Yeah, cool. So you need to build up that structure in the C environment to present that kind of interface in the MicroPython world. Okay? Um, it's going to be really hard to show that much code here, but I'll give it a good crack. Starting at the bottom. That's not even the bottom. That's looking like the bottom. Right. So we register our module. No, we don't. We register our module. We set up the lookup for it just like we did before. We define a dictionary, which is going to be our things that are inside the module. Now, these Qstrs, that I glossed over this before, but it's worth mentioning. They're literally a string lookup. Um, as part of the build process, it goes through and identifies all of these things and turns that into a string, which is uh, everything that's after mp underscore qstr underscore. Okay. Um, so this is defining a uh, class type. We've got a kind of bridging the two things here. This is, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, it, the only important one here is the QR code, um, and we'll dig further into that. So that's defined here. Um, this was the, the class definition. Excuse me. Um, we have the methods that are defined in that class. Uh, just follow along. <laughs> and then for each of those functions, we put the instance of them. And you'll see the first parameter of any of these functions is going to be an in value. And that, we retrieve that just like we would in Python. That, that's referring to the instance of the class itself. Um, so you, you do all these bits and pieces. And again, I want to get the... Uh, the web tool to help generate some of this stuff. Um, but ultimately, you come down to something which can create one of these things, um, which is the encode. No. Oh, wow. 
NK text is the function that was the same as just before. Um, this is calling the project Niyuki stuff. I feel like I'm losing it. So I'm going to go straight to the demo. So bef just like before, we had um, this is a static method. Um, I can prove that to you later. But static method that returns an instance of a QR code. OK, so right. that class that we've defined in C now has these functions. Um, but we've already generated the, we've used encode text to generate one which is populated. We can then get module, whoops, zero, and we could iterate through all of those to get true or falses from everything. So uh, now that's disconnected, it's out of memory. Let's get a print function. Eventually we'll get a print function. So if you look at what this function is doing, it's iterating through this. Is the right thing? Yeah, it's iterating through the QR code to um, to get the module and spit out one of those Unicode characters. And that should be hello world. Um, again, that 11 millisecond penalty that we're paying occurred when the encode text function was called. Um, but now we've got, if you think about what we've got, we've got the best of all of our worlds um, because it's fast. We've got a class that we can deal with. We can generate that in uh, a list comprehension. We could generate it however we want to. Um, it's just as flexible as if it was in Python. Um, so I thought that was kind of worth looking at. The, the details there are heavy and they're hard, but um, come talk to me if you want more, yeah, more information. The final thing that I'm going to struggle to show, I think, um, is native modules. Damien, if you want to help out, it's fine. Um, native modules separates uh, the deployment of your MicroPython blob from the actual uh, C module itself. Um, this, is, this is really new stuff. And if you think about it, you, you, especially if you've got an embedded background, you might understand why. You've got uh, a whole bunch of pointers that when you load them, they need to be reorganized in memory because that could be placed anywhere in the memory space of that micro. Um, the nice thing about this is when it's all working, when we've got all the infrastructure to do so, it's just going to look like a regular MPy file. So we can compile it, and it can have uh, bytecode in it, or it could have native code in it. It doesn't matter. Just uh, from the usage in MicroPython, it's just going to be purely transparent. So um, we can get that, that uh, that benefits in, in performance, and we can also separate it from the MicroPython um, system. So I won't demonstrate that. Um, I've already mentioned all of that. Um, it is worth thinking about how that can affect uh, MicroPython as a system, because it could actually mean that we can trim a lot of the MicroPython system down to a really tight sort of core. Um, and then if we get um, better support by UPIP and by our infrastructure, we can just install the things that we need for our device, and it could really save some flash and some RAM. Um, but we need to do a lot of work here to make sure all of that works. Right? You can think that um, each of those native modules that we build is port specific. So um, if you want to do this right, you would register for each library that you want to deploy separately. You'd need to register that for each of the ports that you require it on. So uh, I think it's a really cool thing to think about. We, we've got a lot of potential here, I think. Um, but a lot of work, too. So. All right, just to wrap it up, because um, I think we're getting close to the time I wanted to spend. Um, the MicroPython like, performance issues, uh, like they're, they're real. Like We saw that it takes a second and a half on a, on a small QR code. But we can overcome that by dropping into C selectively and, and really um, in a targeted sort of fashion. Um, and that way, we can get the benefit of developing at a high level um, and still you know, having great performance. Uh, so yeah, I think the, um, and just to wrap it up, the native modules uh, is a really exciting part uh, in the future. Uh, that's all I wanted to talk about technically, like a couple of things, a couple of things I'll just mention briefly. Great, I just want to take up another couple of minutes because 
Um, diversity is something that I think PyCon does a great job at um, promoting. Uh, but I really feel that like the embedded space suffers worse than many others. So if you're an underrepresented group, you're a woman or whatever you happen to be, and you're interested in this stuff, don't be afraid. Come talk to me, and I'll, I'll spend time getting you guys involved. So uh, I really think it'll help the ecosystem. So I'm sure a few of us feel the same way. So please reach out. Um, I'd love to get more diverse interest in, involved in MicroPython. And another favor, like if you, I don't care about today's talk, um, but for other talks that you've seen, there's a lot of effort that goes into this. Um, so please just let the, the speaker know that you really like their talk. So if I could just ask you guys, like one of the talks that you've seen over this weekend, go tweet or go thank. And I, mean, I think generally people who are attending uh, PyCon do a good job of this anyway, but uh, it's, it's really gratifying to get that kind of feedback. So um, please do that. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to say is like just a call to arms. Like, um, Micropython is exciting. It's really, it's really interesting sort of project, and uh, we could really use some more help. Uh, so if you've got any interest in, you know, it, there's a whole bunch of aspects. We can, we can use people in documentation. We could use people with JavaScript now to help our, our tooling. Uh, if you've got C background, Python background, we can, we can use help across the board. And I think it's a really uh, rewarding and uh, it's, it's a really welcoming community too. So, um, you know, I, I urge you to get involved. Um, Thanks for listening. I do have one little demo before you do your spiel. And Oliver, I think uh, I should get you to do this. Um, first of all, you guys are all software engineers. Um, scope creep is a real thing. And yesterday we were like, we really should get this working on a device. This is a MicroPython talk, right? And so I think we got that working relatively quick. Like you can render a QR code to a little display. That happened relatively quickly. But of course, you sent like you saw the photo of us last night. It was like at eleven o'clock at night or something, and it was like, you know, we could put like this has got Wi-Fi. It can be a web server, <laughs> and you know, then people could get on there and, and generate their own QR codes. So this thing's acting as a, a web server. It's it's advertising an AP, and Oliver's connected to it, I think. Yeah. So when he browses, when you scan the first QR code that comes up on PowerUp, it'll give you the IP address of the web server that you can scan. So on your phone, you can then see the a web page that this thing's serving up to you. And Oliver, if you could uh, do the magic stuff, you can type in whatever you want, and it will generate the QR code and display it. And it's a little self-contained device. The only thing here we've got is a battery. The, um, this guy has the Wi-Fi is all hosting it. What are you doing? What are you, you're not <laughs> <laughs> they're not swear words that are going to be on the video or something like that. It's, um, uh, so that I think you've pushed that. That's open source now. So if you want to go check out that code, it's available. Uh, it uses the what's that? <laughs> how long did you make that string? Um, if you want to go see how the C library is integrated uh, and have a real example of the uh, the web server working, you can you can go check that out. So uh, I think now I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A uh, small token of our, uh, our appreciation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, are there any questions? We have time for probably two or three questions. Uh, yes, we'll start here. I'm naked. <laughs> Sorry. Great talk. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so b before you got into porting the whole library across, does MicroPython have any support for profiling and working out if there's any other sort, if if there was a smaller chunk that would have been profitably optimized, uh, it gives you sort of tools around the fringes. So um, you can certainly measure the duration of function calls, that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of like applying those micro optimizations and seeing if they're going to have a benefit or getting an insight, not really. No. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll ask the, the brains trust here on the front row. But um, have you guys got anything else to add to that, or no? Um, no, there's no 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 easy way to profile like individual fun like like you would do with C. You know, you'd run a prof G prof over it or something. Um, um, uh, you could use decorators to wrap functions to en when you enter and exit. I guess to time them. That would be like. There's not there's not no. um, anything that's easily available. But there is there is some work in progress, and there's a pull request for adding. Um, set trace support to MicroPython so you can trace all bytecodes 
and function entries and exits are really sophisticated, like C Python level um, sophistication for tracing. That's be a little bit more time before that gets in, but that would then be able to be used for profiling. Although that's something you'd need to optionally add to your build because that adds overhead to everything, so you'd only have that for profiling purposes. Yeah, you can, like, as someone with some, some embedded experience, you can sort of get a feel for where you're going to run into problems. Uh, and so profiling manually, is, it's painful, but it's not the end of the world, I would say. Any other questions? Hi, Matt. Uh, thank you so much uh, to you and uh, all MicroPython uh, team. Uh, it helped me a lot. I was uh, a PC developer for 10 years, and then I started writing uh, embedded. Uh, so within a year, I'm writing like production code uh, in embedded area. So my question was that people like me who are very new to embedded space, where we can help in MicroPython, where we can contribute? Uh, the first place I'd say, and it's, it's something that software engineers hate, but documentation. Like, we could really use some uh, help there. We, uh, we try to go for um, the Google season of docs, is that what it's called? Season of docs. Um, and we, had, we have quite a, a rich plan now of where we could improve that documentation. So um, we could hand tasks out to people if they were prepared to do that. It's also a really good way to learn um, about MicroPython. Uh, beyond that, um, walking through the quick ref. Um, we've got a quick ref which describes a lot of the, the basic functions for each of the ports. Uh, it's a really good way just to walk through and, and sort of become aware of what you can do with the system. So that'd be where I'd start, yeah. And any other questions? Uh, yes, one more. I really find the Unix port useful for testing stuff out. Uh, is there any way to fake pins in it? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's something I, I was... I wanted to cover, but lack of time was... Uh, so the Unix port, for everyone that, that um, doesn't know, is uh, it, it's a port of MicroPython, a genuine port like all of the others, but it's just built on, on Linux. Um, so you don't have a machine module, which would normally give you the pin support and the, um, all of the hardware uh, uh, access. But this is Python, right? You can mock that out. So it's quite easy to um, generate stubs to, to pretend that those exist. And in fact, there's a project online, um, I wish I could remember the name of it. It's just, it's like MicroPython Stubber. Um, you might want to have a look, look that up. But it actually will, will stub out a whole bunch of those things, and you can direct that into your Unix port. So that it, it generates a whole bunch of things which do nothing, but give you all the function uh, entry points so your code can be tested on it. Um, that's re really helpful. And uh, really should have mentioned that. Like, the Unix port is exceptionally good for testing. Uh, Andrew covered that a little bit yesterday. but. Uh, it's wonderful for having a real fast iteration loop, um, building, testing on Unix before you even deploy and play with your hardware. It's, it's, a, it's a great, great uh, tool for that. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Cool. No? Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.